So I'm going to very, ma very much make it an ad lib, if I if this works, uh, ad lib chat, because uh, I did this uh, speech about 10 years ago at the London Business School, and I didn't realize it was being videoed, and um, I was very liberal in my use of words, and um, I also was very frank about the story of how I built the business. And I didn't realize that then they were going to put it on the Tell series. And I didn't realize then that when they had a reunion of all the big, all the speakers, there was a huge banner as I walked into the reunion. And it had a huge quote across the top. And I looked at it, I thought, well, that's a very interesting quote. Underneath it, underneath it said, Tell series, Philip Hoffman, the fine art group. Um, so I don't know if there'll be any catchphrase at the end of this. Um, perhaps that the speech overran so badly that we missed our Valentine's dinner. Um, and I think I'm not so delighted that anybody came along on Valentine's evening. Um, but I'm going to try and make it fun. I'm going to try and make it interesting. I'm going to try and liven it up with some uh, stories. I'm going to, if you've got questions, um, I'm happy to take them. And there, this, this speech is not scripted because as I view myself as an entrepreneur, I don't like everything programmed from start to finish. I try and pick up on, on interesting ideas and issues and uh, and how I built my business, which, oh, our business, which is not scripted either. The business wasn't scripted on how it is now. Uh, my background was I became a chartered accountant because my father told me I had to, and I didn't want to do it. Uh, and the long and the short of it is after four or five years, um, KPMG said to me, you're the perfect guy to be finance director of Christie's. And I said, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, and they said, look, it'll be really interesting. I said, is it just a temporary job? And they said, no, you're leaving KPMG and going to become finance director of Christie's. So I became uh, very reluctantly finance director of Christie's when I was 27. And uh, I turned that place upside down. It was the most extraordinary business I'd ever walked into where they, the, the, the cook in the, in the director's boardroom said, um, Philip, what would you like? Actually, they addressed you as Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman, what would you like for lunch? I said, I don't know what you can have for lunch. Um, and they said, well, what's your favorite food? And I said, well, that's irrelevant. What, what, what do you serve? They said, no, we serve whatever your favorite thing is. So if, do you like um, lobster? I said, I absolutely love lobster. They said, Friday, we'll have lobster. So this was the background of Christie's in 1989. And I was, they were trying to suck me into enjoying this lifestyle. And I had to try and rip it apart and say, well, actually, the, you know, this is a business. It's not just an uh, art um, institute, it's not a museum. It is actually a commercial business. So I got into Christie's. I, I re resigned after a year because I said, I've done what I needed to do in, uh, in Christie's. And I wanted to move on to a proper job. And then they said, no, would you like to be deputy chief executive of Christie's? And I said, uh, well, and they said, we'd like you to get involved in the art side. So I had no art background. Um, and I said, look, I can't spell Canaletto. So um, how on earth can I get involved in the art side? And they said, look, you'll learn quite quickly. So they asked me to actually take on the old master department of Christie's in like year two. So I was actually running the old master team of Christie's, which was the most impressive team of academics uh, that I've worked with in my life. And there were about 60 people on the team. And I had to bring them together. And I asked them, I remember asking them, I'd like, let's have a meeting of the whole team. And they said, we've never had a meeting. Well, why do we need a meeting? And they said, I said, well, I'd like all the team to get to know what's going on in, in the old master business. And they said, no, it's confidential. We don't need to share any of this information. We will keep it uh, just only the senior two people need to know what goes on, and the rest, the other 58, just do what we tell them. And I said, it doesn't, I said the, the real world doesn't work quite like that. And I had to persuade them uh, to turn it around. And, um, and, and I'm going to talk about now how I moved on from Christie's. So I was there for 12 years, and then I started um, the fine art group, and let's see if this works. And, and, and what are we now? So I started on my own um, in an office in Mayfair with an idea. And I, it, it, was, it, it was an extremely tough decision to leave being number two or number three in Christie's and setting up my own business. And I decided that I was going to do something that nobody had done. Um, and I didn't realize how tough it was. And talking to many of you who are doing MBA program, uh, I remember outlining that you know you can come up with an idea, you can um, brainstorm with the best people, you can put it all on paper, it looks fantastic, and then when you try and implement it, it is a nightmare. 
It costs more than you think. It takes six times longer, and it's bloody difficult. And you know the challenges. Uh, the, the challenges of I have, I've probably had four thousand meetings with families around the world. Um, I've I've flown to sixty different countries. I've met with the richest families in the world, and. Uh, and when I started, you walk into a meeting and they say, what are you going to talk about? And I say, I'm going to talk about art and, uh, as an asset class, and investing in art. And they say, well, that's lovely. Then we've got an hour to listen to that. And you realize that you get the whole audience. Everybody turns up. So the pension funds, all the boards turn up. You get, you get a wonderful audience. And, the, and at the end of the hour, they say, do you know, Mr. Norman, that's really interesting. Thank, and I said, well, um, we're looking to raise some money. And they said, well, you know, that's the problem. It's a very interesting idea. We're absolutely fascinated, and we've really enjoyed the hour you've given us as an insight into the art market. But um, we, need, uh, you know, we need to ask some questions. I said, well, would you invest in the art market? And they said, well, if you can tick 10 boxes that we're going to ask you now, we'll probably think about doing that. So I said, That's, that seems quite easy. I'm now at the meeting. We've got through the hour. We're into the final stage of the final 10 questions. I just need to tick those 10 boxes. And I, so I said to them, what's the, what's the minimum investment you put into if I, you know, while I'm here? And they said, well, we typically invest 50 to 100 million if we like the idea. I thought, that that's perfect. I can take 50 to 100 million. It seems very easy. So I said, well, let's then rush. Let's just get on with the question, shall we? So let's you know, end the question 10, 100 million. So question number one, you know, we, like, we think this is a very interesting asset class. So I thought, that's fantastic, tick. So we got nine left. What are the other nine? So he said, well, could you just run us through your track record? I said, sorry. And they said, could you run us through your track record? How have you, how have you performed over the last 10 years? Uh, who are your peer groups? What's the industry say? I said, well, we're, we're the first art fund in the world. Ah. Oh. So I, I thought, well, should we move on to question number two? Because maybe if we get eight out of 10, we're nearly there. So he said, well, could you, how long has your team been together? And I said, well, we just put the team together. I mean, they're, they're world class, and they've got great talent, and I've run Christie's and everything. They said, right, so your team haven't actually worked together in running. I said, no, but it's a world class team. So I said, okay, well then, uh, and does Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, are they, are, are they analysts in your area that are analyzing the art market? And I said, well, no, not exactly. We're expecting a lot of them to come in. They said, oh, okay, so that's, so I was thinking it's getting worse. Um, and at, at the end of the day, they said, thank you very much. And I said, well, you know, what, what, what do you think? They said, well, it's very interesting. We'll get back in touch with you. And I had a lot of these meetings. And you come away full of optimism. And I'm an optimistic guy. If you wasn't, I'd have shot myself. Because I went into these meetings thinking, well, you know, it, it's going to be easy. I came out and they said, well, it's interesting. We'll get back in touch with you. So that gives you like a three-month window of optimism, saying, well, they're probably going to get back to you. And, and there's a 50-50, you know, it's either a yes or a no. So it's, it's halfway there. So, uh, and so you sort of hesitantly ring them up about two or three months later waiting for the answer. And they say, you know, it's, we'd love you to come back and see us in a year or two when it's a little bit further developed. And so you sort of park it and you put it in the, you know, one year down the line type of thing. And I had huge numbers of these meetings. And year one uh, was optimism. Year two was reality. What have I got? I've raised no money, not one cent. And a lot of people saying, this is very interesting what you do, investing in art. And year three, I was starting to think, this isn't going to the business plan. I, I, you know, I, I hadn't trained in the, I'd done the MBA, but I'd been uh, trained as a chartered accountant, so I'd worked out how to do the business plan and the goals I had to achieve. And I hadn't met, I'd met, I got some of the goals, I, the structure, the board, um, where it was going to go, the idea, and so on. And the only thing I was lacking was the money. So one, just one small thing. But I remember going to Spain. One of my, one of my colleagues said, um, look, Philip, why don't we go to Spain uh, there are a couple of family offices that we should go and look at. I said, well, where we are in Spain? They said, we're Madrid. I said, well, that's a nice place. So why don't we'll go there, but I'm not, you know, I wasn't very optimistic. In fact, I just thought, we'll book lunch, have a very nice day, get back from Spain, from Madrid. And um, I walked into a meeting, and the family office said, could you present? And after 10 minutes, they said, thank you very much. So I thought, oh, you know, I've come all this way. It's a complete waste of time. 
And uh, they said, we've already decided what we want to do. So I thought, well, I may as well politely ask what they've decided. And they said, well, uh, yes, we'd like, to, we, we wonder whether you could accept $10 million. So I said, I looked at them in, in complete shock. I said, well, could we accept 10 million? I looked at my colleague and I said, well, <laughs> I, think, I, think in, I think we probably could just about squeeze the $10 million in. And they said, fine, well then we're committed for 10 million. And I went to that, we were about to sort of celebrate. We got one deal in three years, about to celebrate. And we go to the next meeting and I said, well, let, let's just get it out of the way and then we can go for lunch and so on. I walked in the meeting and after 10 minutes they said, um, this offer, thank you very much. So I thought, okay, well, that one's short and sweet. And, get on. and they said, we've already made our mind up. And I said, well, what's the decision? And they said, we'd like to give you $10 million. And I went away thinking, I just don't believe this. I've gone from you know, 2,000 meetings at zero. And suddenly I walk into Madrid where I had no intention of closing in, getting any money whatsoever, and they give me $20 million. And, it was, uh, 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 and that started the, what is now the fine art uh, that was the Fine Art Fund, and now it's the Fine Art Group. So the Fine Art Group does now three or four things. So fast forward, um, there are about 60 people involved in the business, 35 or 40 full-time, and in the last four weeks, I, I was just clocking up where I've been in the last four weeks. I started on Bondi Beach for fun then, uh, in the last four weeks, then in Auckland, Hong Kong, business deals in New York, then quickly through London onto Berlin, then back out to um, Doha onto Oman, back uh, a couple of days ago, back through Doha into Paris last night, just for a meeting, and then flew here this morning. And that's the last four weeks. Uh, I probably missed a country in there. And um, if I was on the flight that I was scheduled to be on, which was to be this morning, uh, you would be having no speech at all because uh, the flight got cancelled. So actually, I wouldn't be here tonight. So it was coincidence that I actually made it. Uh, and I'm, and and what's happened to our business is from those days when I was see seeking out business and really worrying where the ha where's this business going to come from. Now we've got three businesses uh, and others lead coming on: art advisory, art lending, art investment funds. Um, and now we look after some of the biggest collectors in the world. Now we look after probably the only art investment funds in the world. And uh, we're into art secured lending. So this is 2001, I founded the Fine Art Fund. And 2004, we launched the first really funds. So it took me three years to get started. So you MBAs who've got a vision, uh, I'm just trying to give you an insight into how tough it is. And the, the best thing that happened to me was that when I was at Christie's, the management su suddenly said to me, Philip, we'd like to start a retail jewellery business. And I said, fine, um, and who do you want to run that? They said, we think you're the right guy to run it. <coughs> I said, I know nothing about jewellery. They said, no, but you're a smart operator, we think you'd be a... And I said, okay, well, then are we going to... Christie's are going to rival Cartier and Graf and... They said, you, you come up with a business plan. You do whatever you like. We'll give you the money. So I thought, well, Christie's got the money. They've got the brand name and everything. And I started putting the business plan together. And I went to them and I said, I need you know, 15 million and I need this, 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 this. And they said, you can't have 15 million. You can't use the brand name. You can't use the shop front. You can't do that. You can do 10% of all the things you've asked for. So I, I went away and I said, so I can't use the brand name. I can't have the money. Uh, I've got to borrow the jewellery at an inflated price and so on. And I started, and they just said, yeah, but you're going to make it successful, aren't you, Philip? We, we, we believe that you're going to make it work. And we lost, uh, I lost them two million pounds of their money in a year and a half or two. It was a wonderful experience, how to learn to lose someone else's money. I had no risk. I, could do, I couldn't do what I wanted. I just had to do what they had decided within a few parameters, um, but it was a great learning curve. And in fact, um, it gave me an insight into jewelry that I hadn't ever had. And I remember I, I've held some of the most expensive jewelry in the world. And now we, ha we, we are involved in looking after the biggest jewelry client in the world. And we, um, we get involved in, in diamonds from, uh, from, from a million up to 
nearly 100 million. Um, now, so the business has changed dramatically. So we had an advisory business. Then we introduced, I came up with this idea of launching a guarantee fund. So I, I spend my life trying to dream up, while I'm on an airplane, dreaming up a new idea for the art world and for the art market. Um, and it's a really interesting challenge. And you've got a captive audience of people who are fascinated by the art world. People wonder what the art world really is. And the art world goes, there are about 70 different headings. So it starts with dinky toys as part of the art world. And I remember going into Christie's dinky toy department and saying, uh, walked into their department, and I said, uh, I said, tell me, that, that Batman car on the wall there, um, how much is it? And they said, that, that Batman car over there is 2,000 pounds. And this was uh, 30 years ago. I said, that's, that's amazing, because I've got the very same Batman car at home. And I said, that, I, I, I might sell it. They said, well, have you, um, have you played with it? And I said, yeah, when I was seven, I used to play with it. They said, well, that's probably why it's not worth 2,000. So I said, well, I mean, I'll take 1,500. <laughs> and they said, um, it's probably worth about three pounds. And suddenly I started realizing that there were some nuances of the art world that a new, new person into the business didn't have a clue about. And, um, and I remember walking into the old master, um, uh, into the old master sale. And there were two pictures on the wall. One was, by, uh, one was priced at 300,000 and one was priced at 5,000. And my parents had given me some money and said, now you're Christie's, buy something with 5,000 pounds. And, and I looked at it, it was hanging in the, in, in the great rooms of Christie's and it was of St. Mark's Square, dated 1740. Um, and I didn't read the bottom underneath, I just thought 1740 St. Mark's Square and at 5,000 pounds. So I said, uh, I said to the head of Christie's at that time, Charles Beddington, I said, uh, he was the world's Canaletto expert, I said to him, Charles, I'm going to buy this. I'm really excited. It's going to be my first picture. He said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean I'm not? No, I, I'm, I, is there a rule I can't buy it? He said, I'm not allowing you to buy it. So I said, what do you mean I'm not allowing me? As a director of Christie's, you cannot own this crap. Mm -hmm. And I said, but, it, but it's hanging on the wall here at Christie's, and it's of St. Mark's where it says 1714. He said, yeah, it says circle of. He said, and actually most of it was painted, once it says 1740, most of it was painted in 1980. <coughs> and there's very little of the original picture there. He said, this is the picture you need to buy. And so I, he walked me over to the right. And he said, he said now have a look at this. And I said, it's almost the same as this one. I said, I can't really see the difference. He said, there's a slight difference. This is by Canaletto. So I said, well, how much is it? He said, 350,000. And he said, that's the picture you've got to buy. I said, Charles, I don't have 350,000. And... Uh, that picture, the picture that I would have bought for 5,000 is unsaleable, and the picture that I should have bought for 350,000 is now worth about three and a half million. Um, now, it's taken me 30 years in the art world to get to know a little bit about various subject headings in the, in the art world. But I'm the first to me, although I run one of the, maybe one of the top 10 art business in the world in terms, certainly in these fields, number one in quite a few of them, um, I, I admit that I know very little about art. I happen to wander into the galleries, I wander around the auctions, I, we buy and sell millions and millions of dollars of art every week. And um, to give you an idea, I'm involved right now in a deal that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, we'll touch on that. But the business has completely transformed and that learning curve from the early days of being asked to spell Canaletto and get involved in the old masters, and get involved in setting up a jewelry business, have been invaluable into building all these stepping stones of the business. So now um, we've got involved in emerging funds. So we, I had a look at some of the wonderful contemporary art on display here. And we buy, we have, a, we have a, a business that just focuses on buying contemporary art. We have a business that helps build some of the biggest collections of art in the world. We have a, um, a business that does huge amounts of volumes with Christie's and Sotheby's. Um, and we have, in the last 18 years, we've been involved in about 820 million of transactions that we've, we're involved in. We've been uh, involved in about 380 million in the last few years with just Christie's and Sotheby's alone. We've now built 120 clients in 20, actually it's 24 countries. And having gone from KPMG through to Christie's, the Fine Art Group, suddenly I got asked to join the 
fundraising board of the National Portrait Gallery, the board of the Chelsea and Westminster, and I'm on the board of Christie's Education. And so it snowballs. So the, the busier you are, the more they ask you to get involved in all these other things. Um, and the, the, the challenge is um, identifying an opportunity. Now, this was very early on in uh, Christie's. Um, and I, there, my chairman was a chap called Peter Carrington, Lord Carrington. He was Secretary General of NATO, became chairman of Christie's. Um, and in those days, Christie's was the most fantastic place to see all the celebrities walking in and out for boardroom lunches. So Princess Diana used to come in every two weeks for lunch uh, in the Christie's boardroom. We had Margaret Thatcher and Edward Heath in the same board lunch, and they had a raging argument. Um, I've seen divorces start over lunch at Christie's, all sorts of uh, fascinating. But in this particular instance, um, a lady walked in to the Christie's rooms and said, have you, she turned to her husband and said, darling, have you seen that picture over there? That has got the same blues and greens as our wallpaper. <laughs> and she walked over to me and to Lord Carrington and she said, um, she said, what is it and how much is it? So he said, madam, it's by an artist called Monet and it is estimated four to six million. And so she turned to her husband and said, Darling, if we buy this for five million, we won't have to redecorate the drawing room. <laughs> I was listening to this and I'm thinking, is this real? You know, is this how the art world works? And she bought it for five million at the auction. And they didn't have to redecorate the drawing room. So art is a sort of wallpaper for her. But um, the due diligence she did, and I'm gonna to touch on this, this is what our business is about, was about three minutes. It's what's the name of the artist? Oh yeah, I've heard that one. Does it match the wallpaper? And it looks quite nice. And that was it, five million. And nothing much has changed in many of these areas because the, now, people is, now people are paying 50 million. I mean, I had a client, I had a client who went to Sotheby's and he had never been in their front door before. And they, took, they, they, they knew he was very wealthy. They invited him for a wonderful lunch. He had a lot to drink and his family office the following week, got a call, and I was there that day, and they said, we've got a problem, Philip. And I said, what's the problem? And they said, our, our owner has just bought a Picasso for 60 million and a, another picture for 10 million. And I said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, he doesn't ever buy art. He never bought any art before. And I said, well, did he do his homework? Did, you know, no, he had a fantastic lunch at Sotheby's, and he bought these two pictures. And I said, well, I mean, they're great pictures, but I mean, it's a lot of money to pay for them. And then they said, um, they said, but we just want to know, he wants to ship it back to his house in Brazil. And I said, that's, that's interesting. Has he thought about the, um, the taxes? And they said, no. And I said, well, there's a slight problem. And they said, well, give us your advice. That's where our advisory service came in. I said, well, um, four sevens are 28. I think it's right. I'm quite tired, but anyway. Four he, they said, what's the meaning of that? I said, tax bill, 28 million. He said, you're joking. I said, he didn't, did he check that? He said, no. I said, they said, we, we've got to pay 28 million to import the pictures into Brazil. I said, yes. So they said, well, we don't want them then. So I said, he should have done his homework. So it's a bit like the, t the, the, the lady here. Now, I said, they said, what would you do? I said, spend 28 million on an apartment in New York and hang them there. So they said, that's a good idea, so he did that. Um, so, so occasionally people listen to our advice. So what we try to do, and this is our become our unique selling point, is just the, a simple word, due diligence. Understanding what on earth you're doing when you're buying a work of art. Are you buying a real or a fake? Are you buying something that's been painted, that's allegedly painted in 1740, but actually painted in 1970? Um, is it by the artist? Now, here was an example, and, and this affects my business now because I'm involved in buying the most expensive pictures in the world for clients, for funds. We're lending money. So I've got a finance business that lends money against art. Uh, we've got advisory, and we've got to be very, very sharp because the more valuable the art is and the bigger our business grows, the more prone we are to the risks and and difficulties of um, things going wrong in the art market. 
uh, and with pictures. And I was asked to speak at the Law Society about all the mess ups in the art world. And I had story upon story. I could go on for ages about the things that go wrong. And this, there was a, a Picasso uh, uh, that was sent to Christie's for auction, and it had a price tag of $8 million. And we were, they were about to sell it. And a day before, somebody rang up from America and said, could you pull the picture? And they said, what do you mean? He said, I've got the original here, and you've got a copy. And they said, no, we've got the original. You must have a copy. And they said, well, and, they, and, and because they, if you're looking at art and, and the issue of fakes and forgeries, you, can, you look as much at the front of the picture as you do at the reverse of the picture. So in fact, the art experts that we work with, and we've got the former head of Christie's Impressionist Department, Guy Jennings, who, who was chairman of Christie's Impressionist. Uh, we've got the former head of jewelry from, from, from London. We've got a big art team. They spend as much time doing ultraviolet light checks to see the in-painting as to looking at the back and the stretcher and the, and the canvas and the, the labels. And on the back of, of one of them was um, all the labels from Sotheby's, where it being sold, the history, the stretcher on the back, it was all original. The only problem was the front was a fake. The back was original. So what had happened at one point, somebody had owned the original, split it in two, took the back off, got an, a new one painted, um, sold that one for six million, and kept the original with a, with a different back. And somebody made a tidy six million. And in the end, they, it was only when we got the picture shipped to London and compared the two next to each other and looked at minute detail to realize that one had been faked, that we picked up on this whole issue. Um, so this was one of the first paintings we bought. And I'm a big risk taker, but it's a calculated risk. You know, I took a risk when I left Christie's, great place to be, and started my own business. Three years, zero. Suddenly, the number 11 bus comes two in a row or three in a row. Um, my t art team said, you've got to, this was in uh, 2005. So uh, what is it, 13 years ago. Said, Cindy Sherman is a really interesting artist to acquire for, our, for one of our art investments. And we bought it for 82,000. And I said, I think we're nuts. I said, I don't like it. And they said, Philip, we did, you're not chief executive of this business, and you're not running a business to buy art you like. You're running a business because it has a focus on investing in art, and you've hired the world's best experts, and that's what this business is about. And I said, you're absolutely right. Put me back in the box. I just don't like it, but if um, you think we can make money, uh, we'll do it. And I got the experts who were involved. I said, would you put your own money into it? And they said, yeah, we would. And they, they always talk a lot, but they don't always deliver. So I said, OK, you're on. 10%. If you're in, I'll buy the rest. And they said, oh, I didn't realize you meant our money right now. And I said, well, that's what I mean. And so I got them to co-invest, and we sold it for 250000 and they made a great deal of money. Um, now, I, I wasn't the guy who thought up this idea. So I don't, I don't say, look, I was the bright spark that came up with an invest in, investing in art. It's been done before. But... Um, Sotheby's uh, worked with the British Royal Pension Fund, and they got involved in selling a great deal of art, and the pension fund made a reasonable amount of money. Um, and so I looked at this and thought, that's really interesting. Can we get multiple, rather than one pension fund, can we get multiple investors into this idea? So I took that and, and took a basic idea and then helped deliver it to, to the end result. And that is what being an entrepreneur is about. It's not coming up with the brightest idea in the box. It's coming up with something that's quite smart and then seeing if you can deliver to the end result. Um, and you know, you've got to know what your value is, know your business, know the market. And even today, what I'm trying to do is difficult. And it, there is no plain sailing. And what we have got, it, what I've done is, since I started with one art fund, I said, you know what we've got to do? We've got to diversify the business fast. As soon as I've got art funds sorted out, we're going to advisory. As soon as I've got advisory sorted out, we're going to art lending. As soon as I've got art lending, we get, we're going to go into collection management, looking after major collections. And then I've got game plan next, and the next game plan, and so on. And 
I'm, my view is I want to diversify the business across five or six different headings. Do I want to dream about buying Christie's or Sotheby's as an auction house? Maybe some of the clients have said, would you, do, would you organize that? So nothing is off the cards, but you've got to focus on what you're best at. Um, and you've got to apply, and I'm very bad at focusing on one bit of detail for a long period of time. So I had to put a team of people together who could deal with all my weaknesses. And I've got lots of weaknesses, but my main strength was coming up with an idea and getting it to fruition. Um, and having people who would pick up the pieces as I went along. And if you, you, know, you work out what you're good at, and you work out the other people that aren't, you don't want everybody identical. You want people who are going to complement what you're missing. And so in my team of now, 35 or 40 people, we got people who are brilliant administration, people who are brilliant lawyers, people who are brilliant at maths and, and, and number crunching, brilliant art experts in their different fields. Because also I realized that a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. So you need top experts to advise you. So when we buy a work of art, or get involved in a work of art, I mean, just to give you an idea, we were asked to sell a tribal, a little, a tribal head. Um, and it was very rare. And my client called me and said, Philip, could you deal with this? And I looked at it and I thought, what do I do with it? I, if I went to a boot fair, I wouldn't buy it for $5. And, and he was a very, very important client. And I thought, well, he probably paid more than $5. Otherwise, he wouldn't ask me to handle it. And I said, well, tell me about it and so on. And he told me a bit. And then I said, well, we need to, I need to talk to some of the experts. And, and then and I, he said, all I want you to do, Philip, is get me the cost back. So I thought, well, I said, what was the cost? He said, I don't know the numbers off my, ring my office and they'll tell you what it was. So I was thinking, you know, I don't know, 20,000, maybe 50,000. Knowing him, it might be 100,000. And I rang them and they said, um, Philip, uh, we've got the cost here, here we are, two million. I said, well, hang on a minute, now, have you got the right piece? They said, yes, it's two million. So I looked at him and thought, all he asked me to do was to get two million back. How on earth am I gonna do that? That was like a world record price practically for work by tribal art. So I then said to, I said to my team, look, how are we going to do this? How are we going to achieve a new world record price on something that is so difficult, so esoteric, so niche? So I sat down with the head of Christie's and the team there. I sat down with the Sotheby's, and there was a very different approach. And Sotheby's said, let's just do a private sale and ask for three million and hope to get two. So I said, that's not going to work. I went to Christie's and I said, well, let's just brainstorm what we could do. And they said, well, do you know what? It looks a bit like a Giacometti. So I said, there we're starting. How much do Giacometti's make? 40, 105 million. So we're in the right, we're getting into the right area. Now we've got to cross market. So I said, let's start cross marketing this with contemporary where all the money is and get the big clients who are buying that to have a look at this piece of tribal art. We took it on a around the world tour and we juxtapositioned it next to a Giacometti sculpture that was at 40 million. We did a huge amount of marketing. And on the day of the sale, I was actually on holiday, and I forgot uh, to check what was happening. And I suddenly got a phone call. I saw the client ringing, and I thought, oh my god, it's a disaster. I forgot to track the final moment, and you know, it didn't sell, or the, the whole idea was a waste of time. And I put a lot of effort into it, and I thought, oh no. And, he, and I picked up the phone. He said, Philip. And I thought, well, the tone of voice is positive. So I'm not in you know, total disaster. So it must have sold. He said, Philip, he said, um, do you want to know the, the result? I said, well, you're faster than I am. Just tell me how, how, just bring me up to speed. I didn't quite catch. I hadn't had my chance to ring. He said, 10 million. I said, sorry? He said, 10 million. You're a genius. I can't believe it. You've got 10 million for this. He said, check for 500,000 coming your way. Thank you very much. So um, that was just brainstorming, coming up with a bright idea, sitting down with the top people and saying, look, why do you have to do it like this? Now, I'm in the middle of a deal right now where we're doing exactly the same thing. We're saying, don't, uh, you know, for instance, we took a, we were given a blue diamond um, and it was estimated at uh, 12 and a half, he bought it for 12 million. And he said, just get me a little profit, it'd be nice. And I said, well, it's not that easy. It's a very um, traded market. It's not that easy to create. So I sat down with, this time, I got the creative team at Sotheby's. And I said, what have we got to do to create an interest in this? And they said, we've got to turn the jewelry market upside down and do something very interesting. We've got to have influencers who wear the, the diamond. 
we've got to have the right people see with it. I said, let's start. Let's get moving on this. I said, we'll invest half a million dollars in marketing this. And they got some Victoria's Secrets girl to model this. And the next thing is, the next day, the day we launched it was the day that Kim Kardashian had had all her jewelry stolen in um, Paris. And uh, there was a whole hoo-ha about losing the jewelry. And the headline was, you know, Kardashian needs to buy the sky blue diamond. And suddenly this, we named it the sky blue diamond, which out of, we just sat there and dreamt up a name. And suddenly the sky blue diamond was on Instagram one and a half million times. It was on the front page of every newspaper around the world. Kim <coughs> Kardashian needs to buy the sky blue diamond coming up at Sotheby's. It, it made the client, we sold it for just under 18 million, maybe four or five million in two years. And, 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 and that was looking at the art market in a different way. And that's what I'm trying to say to the entrepreneurs. Don't always look at it straight on and say, it was done like this, so we'll do it again like that. My forte is to say, it was done like this, let's do it differently next time round. Um, so with the fund, you know, we got, we, we started with an art fund, we got, we turned our track record into giving people who wanted to come into the art world or who had knowledge of the art world, give them the confidence that we knew what we were doing. So we weren't just financial buffs who were coming in and ripping this thing apart. We were actually a smart group of people, mixture of art and businessmen and lawyers and so on, and saying, how can we bring a brilliant team together and do things professionally in a market that has been full of people wandering in and saying, I like that picture because it fits the wallpaper, and they don't do any of their homework. They don't check all the detail. We, before we work by a picture, we go through a checklist of about 20 different things. We do the art historical review, we do the financial review, we do all sorts, and then we send conservators in to check absolutely everything. We do that on every picture, whether it's, whether it's a $10,000 picture or, or a $50 million picture. Um, now, I'm gonna test out some skill here in the room, um, and because I know that quite a lot of you are art experts, and I am going to find out how many of the room uh, think that picture, there's one picture that made 10 million and one picture that didn't sell at under a million. So I'm going to ask you, the picture that made, uh, that, that didn't sell, that didn't sell under a million, who thinks it's picture A? Put your hand up if you think it's picture A that didn't sell for under a million. So let me see more, anybody? So there's sort of 70% of the room think that picture A didn't sell. And okay, who thinks picture B um, is, is, is the one that didn't sell or, or is under a million? Who thinks picture B? So only about a third of you. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, I'm glad that you come for a history of art lesson because you need it. Because that picture sold for 10 and that was unsaleable. And do you know what was interesting was I did this exercise with 250 tycoons in Hong Kong last week with my colleague here, Jonathan Orders, and I asked them exactly the same question. They all thought they knew the answer, and the same answer, 70% of the room, was completely wrong. Um, and it gives you an idea, and, and actually the majority of art purchases are done on the basis of quickly looking at it. I like it. The estimate's four to six million. If I buy it for five, seems like a good idea. Now, they, they don't, when you're buying a house, you bring an architect, a surveyor, accountant, lawyers, a, a, and that's for, a, I don't know what it is, 200,000, 500,000, whatever the price of the house is. Um, but when they go in to buy art, very, very few do any homework. Um, or they might ask an art historian, is it historically important? and then get carried away because, and, and the price becomes ridiculous. They don't do the whole rounded view. So, so which is the most valuable of these three? Because I know it's Valentine's Day, you might be getting a present tonight. Um, and there's the flawless blue which you hope for, or the white maybe, or the pink. Who thinks uh, that, the, who thinks the most valuable, if they were all the same size and all perfectly flawless, who thinks the most valuable is the blue? Hands up. Majority of the girls think blue. Who thinks the white? Guys think yes, all the And then who thinks the pink? Um, right, so let's see. The blue. 
Um, now, I, when I was doing the speech in Hong Kong, I put up one of the most expensive blues that um, was, and I, I put a slide up um, with, with Morgan Stanley. I said, we're going to put the slide up about this most expensive blue uh, that was sold in the world. They said to me, Philip, it'd be a bit awkward. Could you, could you possibly take that slide out? And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, the audience, you know, it could be awkward. So I said, ah, I see what you mean. So the, the buyer of the blue is in the room. So they said, we can't say that, but we'd like you to take the slide out. So then they went on the next slide. I said, I said, well, here's the most fantastic pink that sold for 69 million. My client underbid it, and there was this other guy who, who bought it. And, uh, and, and they said, could you take that slide out as well? <laughs> so I said, ah, oh, so um, two. The two top people are. Uh, and then I, I then said, well, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about fakes and forgeries. And they said, ah, oh, well, we've got a lot of people from... Um, China, where the work might have been made, and we would um, we'd rather you take that one out as well. So I thought of my slides were sort of slowly diminishing in Hong Kong, but I put them all in here. Um, so the half a billion dollar question. So I was with the head of Christie's, uh, who who sold this brilliant marketing. So they put the, they followed on from that idea of that African um, piece with a Giacometti to put an old master in a contemporary set. And everybody said, you're nuts. And also, um, everybody said, well, um, what's it worth? And it, it, it was put in. We were offered it 80 million. I turned it down. Uh, why did I turn it down? Because we looked at it, and we had the scholars look at it, and we just weren't sure how much of it was right. Now, who thinks it's right, or who thinks it's wrong? So who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's A, that it's by Leonardo, it's original Leonardo? Not uh, two or three, four, five. Yeah, half decided. And who thinks B, then? The majority of the room. Well, it's interesting. This, this has a story that could make the front page, and has made the front page of the New York Times um, and the Times, and on it goes. The story starts with a with, um, with client who bought it originally being ripped off to the tune of tens of millions. Um, transaction costs enormous, lawsuits all over the world, this goes up for sale, guarantee, it was guaranteed at 100 million. It, it sold for $450 million. There were six people bidding at over 150 million, two took it on from 300 million up, and um, the question is, is it right or isn't it? It is sitting right now, it's been paid for, uh, it was a combination of Abu Dhabi and Saudi um, involved. It's meant to be hanging in the Louvre Abu Dhabi today, and it's hanging in a warehouse in Geneva right now because um, they're not sure if they accept it as being right, and they're not sure if they want to exhibit it now because there is so much academic discussion about whether it's right or it's wrong. And 90% of the academics say it's right, and 10% who have got a loud voice say it's wrong. So um, that's a problem. This rare, rare Ming vase was sold, and um, it was. It, 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 who thinks that that is worth five million? And who thinks it? So who thinks it's worth five million? The other is who thinks it's worth less than a million? So five option A, five million. Who thinks it's worth five million? A lot. Pretty impressive. And half, half a million, less than a million? Just one or two? Well, um, 825,000, it was worth five million pounds, seven and a half million, but the owner turned it into a lamp. <laughs> which is a bit of a shame. Um, I mean, it's a lovely lamp, um, but he knocked off um, seven million by putting the screw holes through the middle. Um, and trust me, I've seen, we, we, we've dealt in Chinese art, and I've seen the most fantastic fakes. So they've got a Ming, a Ming vase. The original on the bottom is, uh, is perfect, absolutely perfect. And the, the whole vase, what's really rare about it was it was in perfect, the whole thing was perfect condition, incredibly rare, 
And some of the top dealers couldn't believe it was estimated at sort of 500,000. And they were, th they were drooling over it because they thought it's worth five or 10 million. And if nobody else spots it, we could get it cheap. Anyway, it made five or 10 million. And, um, and one of our experts who were looking at it looked at it and thought it's amazing to have this Ming vase in perfect condition, so rare. And he looked at it for like three hours. And I said, well, what, what can you see by looking at it for three hours? He said, he said, you know, I looked at all the lines going down the, on, the, on, the, on the decoration. And at the very bottom, the lines didn't quite join up. And I said, well, what, what does that mean? He said, what they'd done is that the original had been smashed. They'd chopped off the bottom and kept the original base. And they'd built a brand new top and absolutely got it perfect, except for the final lines at the bottom where it joined. And they weren't quite lined up so slightly out. And they then realized that it was an original base and a fake on the top. Um, so we started with those three orig originally. We then um, moved on to the senior team, which is now this lot. Um, so a lot of ex-Christie's and Sotheby's people. Um, and we're now 40 strong and trying to grow the business. I want to build it up, if I'm lucky, to about 100 people over the next few years. And we operate on a global scale with, with business in America, the UK, Switzerland, Germany, Hong Kong, uh, Middle East. Now, it looks very grand, but we actually just have, we have either an office or representative, and we'll, but we'll be expanding our offices in America and in Asia because we have clients in all those different places. Um, and market potential. This is just some studies on how it's going to grow, where I see the art market. I see this business being enor potentially enormous over the next 10 years. The amount of money that's interested in art is huge. Most people are scared by the art market because they don't have the knowledge and expertise. So they need a group like us who gives them the help and the insight to, and confidence to spend more than 10 or 20,000 on a work of art and actually buy very rare art. So, um, you know, there are huge amounts of new developments going in the art market. There are huge opportunities for you to make money out of the art market. It is enormous fun. You deal with the most amazing and ridiculous people. They're incredibly academic. They're very eccentric. They're very rich. They're very spoilt. Uh, they're underpaid. It's a whole range of all this mix that's going on in the art world. And that's what I love about it. And last night, I was with one of the richest people in the world in one of the grandest houses in the world. And um, today, I'm talking to the wannabes who are going to be the next richest people in the world, who are going to be the MBAs, who one of you is probably going to make billions out of an idea you come up with. Is it going to be the art market? Probably not. Um, although, there's one family called the Neymad family, another called the McGrawby family, who have been pumping billions into the art market, and they control billions of dollars of um, impressionist and modern art. They made it originally out of currency trading, and they moved all that money into Picassos and Cezannes and, and such like. And so they, they have turned a few hundred million into multi-billions. And um, so these are all the opportunities that I'm thinking about, and where does it fit in? I'm not very good at some of the news of blockchain, and, and, and all, but I bring in people who are very good at it who will be able to work it out, and I'll sit down with them and brainstorm. So it's very tough to start your own business. You've got to be quite brave. Um, and you've got to see it through. Um, you've got to stick to your idea. And don't, don't get too sidetracked. Don't try to do too many things at the first stage. It's very easy to go off and say, well, look, if I do that and that one and that one will hit one of those, just focus on what you think is going to make the most success and what you're going to enjoy. I enjoy 70% of what I do. What I, my philosophy in our business is everything we do has got to be professional, it's got to be profitable, and it's got to be fun. And if it's not all three, I won't do it. When I was working for Christie's, it only had to be professional and profitable because I was employed by somebody, and they said, we don't care whether it's fun or not, you do it. In, in our business, I'm trying to make it fun. It's very, very tough, and we are swimming against the tide because... We're the only guys in the world that have investment funds. We're buying up businesses in the art lending business, and we're, we're taking out the competitors. We're, we're swimming against the tide. It's very tough, but we're professional, and we're growing the business, and we're getting hired by more and more people in the art world. Um, 
determination. Um, you know, I never thought that that was a uh, that was a key constituent. I hadn't thought about it, but I realized that I have been very, very focused um, on building the business, and I enjoy working hard. I've been working, you know, in the last few weeks on this particular transaction I've been involved in, I've been working at two in the morning, six in the morning, all sorts of hours, because I've got clients in different time jurisdictions, and I, I have to deal with their requests, and they expect a reply. That's the horrible thing about iPhones and iPads, and is that people get want an answer, and the faster you give the answer, the faster they ask another question, and it's, it's pretty draining. Uh, and I'm sucked in this transaction. I can't get out of it. If I drop it, the whole thing will fall apart, and I'll be fired. So you, you've got to be consistent. You've got to be tough. You've got to be determined. Um, you've got to know when to quit. So there are ideas that I've had that I, everybody sat and said they're nuts. Now, usually I say, come on, if they're nuts, I'm more interested in them. And you sort of work them through, and you get the brains around the table. But um, you've got to say, well, actually, that's a waste of time, or that's not going to work. And what we've learned is, what is the winning formula? What makes sense? I still haven't got it right. We've still got a long way. We're learning all the time. But as we learn, we're having enormous fun. We're dealing with some of the most interesting people in the art world. We're dealing with a very, very complicated um, uh, um, industry because there's the complications of is it right or is it wrong? Is it Nazi war loot? Um, has, has it got a hole in it? Has it got repairs? And the technology that's come into the art market is so clever that you can be fooled if you don't have the top experts on, on top of their game. So that's the summary. What I like, the last time I came to the side business school to do a speech, uh, what was interesting was that there was a panel of four of us, and there was, it was the four private equity funds talking about how they run their business and build their business up. And there was Pamira, I think, with 15 billion, Terra Firma, Guy Hans, with about 10 billion. There was another one with about 20 billion. And I got up and I said, I've got, I managed 15 million. And the audience looked and, they, and my panel looked and said, sorry, did you, did you, I didn't quite hear, did you say 15 billion? I said, no, 15 million. And I said, I'm the new boy. I've started that, this was year four in my business. And um, they perked up and two out of the three on the panel invested millions of dollars with me after that meeting. So I'm really optimistic <laughs> that I've come back for the second go and see that, which is why I flew in early, especially to be here. Um, that's the end of what I'm going to talk about. I don't know if anybody wants to have questions. I know we've, we've run out, nearly run out of time. Um, does anybody want to ask me anything? Easy, hard, hands up if you've got. Yeah. Hi, uh, what are the key ethical issues that you have to deal with? That is the key. The art market is so, the commercial art market is so disreputable. And I was shocked at how they'd sell their grandmother. They would lie through their teeth. They'll tell you that they're selling this picture for less than they paid for it. The amount of times I've heard that. I'm giving it, I'm losing money uh, for, to let you have it. Um, and there's so many lies and so much um, uh, so much said, so much salesmanship, and I don't believe a word of it. I just go in completely cold, and the reason our business has grown is because I believe ethics are a critical part of the business. So in the art world, I mean, I could, in the 800 million that we traded, I could have creamed off 80 million for myself quite easily, and nobody noticed. Um, I creamed off 100, but... Um, <laughs> No, I, I very disciplined at saying, when we do business for you, this is how we operate. We operate and we charge you 2% or 1% or whatever the number is, and people know that's it. And what's happened is that people have come into the art market and they make, you can make a fast buck by cheating and you can get away with it for a year or two and then it comes back to haunt you. And so there are a lot of people who come into the art market, make a fast buck and disappear. And we've been in the market now for 20 years I've been doing this. It seems an awful long time. I can't believe I've done this for 20 years. And we've been so careful because reputation is everything. And so it always comes back to haunt you. So, so ethical issues are critical. And that is the backbone of why our business has probably grown better than many other businesses is because we weren't taken into the temptation. And there are lots of temptation of how you could take advantage of your clients.
Any other questions? Yeah. We have different uh, categories of the um, arts work. So yeah. at current um, uh, stage, have you involved in all the categories or you have specialized in certain category like painting or? So we, we get involved in all categories. I mean, there are seven categories, 70 seven categories. categories yes. We get involved in the most, um, we get involved in young contemporary art. We get involved in contemporary, impressionist, modern, old masters. We get into sculpture, video art. We get involved in jewelry. We have got involved in tribal, furniture, watches, um, in different ways. Now that, we've missed out a whole load. We don't get involved in uh, American art, but occasionally we get brought into that. Um, but our real expertise in, is in four core, core areas. So I might, we might advise in quite a wide group, but we don't put money, our money, and our clients' money into areas beyond about four, because that's where we got the top expertise. As we know, in the, even in the art collection world, actually the business model is changed. So what, do you have any comments about like online collection platforms? What do you think about them? That's a whole other subject. I have a lot of views about it. Um, it's uh, highly replicable. There are lots of ideas. Uh, people have gone into this, into this sort of online area of the art market. Two companies have invested $100 million, and they've lost all $100 million. Christian's other business have invested another 50 or 100 million, they've lost that. So it's a very quick way to spend money and everybody says, well look, if you could, if you could take um, uh, eBay and do it with art, or if you could take Amazon or whatever with art um, and, 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 and have it all computerized and, and people could buy online and just, it isn't going to happen. People have lost a fortune. I may be sticking my neck out here, I may be being uh, you know, it, just putting my head in, in sand. But I, I'm not investing any money in that area right now. I think that you could lose another 100 million or 200 million. It'll take a long time. People want the fun of coming to buy that Monet that matches the wallpaper. They want to turn up. They want to have the experience. They want the lunch at Sotheby's. They want the entertainment. It's theatre. It's fun. It's a hobby. It's passion. People want to get on a plane. You know, if you're buying a pair of socks, you just go online, you can do it, you know it's seven pounds or eight pounds or whatever. If you're buying a Picasso for five million, it's a whole exciting journey. It's part of your building or collection. Thank you so much. And the last one is about what's your perspective with Chinese market? <laughs> and what's your plan maybe a little bit? <laughs> so I, I'm very, very optimistic and interested in the Chinese market. We have Chinese clients, we have clients in Hong Kong. Um, Jonathan spends a lot of time going over to Asia. We're building the business out there. Very, very difficult. Uh, because also, being Anglo-Saxon, going over to China, it's very, very tough. You don't know your way around. And I, I remember one guy said to me, um, he said, how much do you manage? And I said, well, we're probably involved in about four, five hundred million. He said, don't say that. I said, why not? He said, then you're nobody. So he said, well, I said, what have I got to say? He said, say a billion. I said, well, why do I say a billion? He said, well, because they won't take you seriously if you don't have a billion. Or, or say two. So I said, well, I, I, I can't. That's not how we operate. Because in, in New York, they're going to ask, can we see the financial records? Where is the two billion? And, and I went into one office. And they said, here's President. They, they had photographs of President Z and Bill Clinton and everything. And I said, how big's your business? They said, enormous. And I said, well, how big is it? And they said, well, look, President Z photographed here. Bill Clinton here, me in the middle, so on. I said, but yeah, can I just ask, how big's your business? And they said, it's big. <laughs> and I said, well, they said, can't, you can tell from, from the photographs. And I said, well, I, it's not quite how we do it in London, but I perhaps need to learn. So I've got to understand how to do business in China. It's not that easy. And everyone, if everybody tells you that they're worth a billion or two, you then have to do all the homework and if you tap into the internet and type in Z, you get a thousand of them. You can't work out which one is which. If you type in Bill Gates, you get one, and you know it's Microsoft, and you know who you're dealing with. In China, it's not. So I'm learning. I've been investing in China for 10 years, and I'm going to invest massively more, but I'm learning some of the difficulties. Anybody else got a question? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your story and journey. It's absolutely fascinating and eye-opening. Uh, my question uh, relates to the valuation of art. As you know, valuation is art and science. I suppose for art, it's probably yeah. definitely towards the art side of the spectrum. Do you have a proprietary database where you look at the artists, different asset class, 
you know, what's the science and math behind the valuation? And also, you mentioned you're the only professional art fund in the world. I suppose that's, again, double-edged sword, because there's no benchmark when it comes to assessing performance. Yeah. How do you manage sort of investors' expectation, you know, private equity or other public funds? There is a rough sort of ballpark when it comes to long-term valuation, volatility, that type of parameter. So when, when the art market soared in 89-90, the newspapers talked about valuing a Van Gogh per square inch. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, the bigger the picture, the more yellow, add a bit of blue, and you've got a 60 million one. Take the blue out, 30, and, and put green in, 20, and shrink it down, five. Um, and then they said, well, no, we can get a bit more sophisticated than that. And the fact is, there is no proprietary database that gives you those answers. It, there is information that gives you a guide, but then you bring the experts in, because um, if a picture's ripped, so I'll, I'll give you a quick story. The, the client, client came to me and he said, Philip, I've got an incredible deal. I'm so happy. So I said, what is it? He said, I bought a Monet. It was sold four years ago for 10 million. I distressed sale, the dealer let me have it, for six. And he said, I've got it on record, it's sold for 10, I got it for six. I've saved four million for a beautiful money. So I said, well, he said, come and have a look. What do you think it's worth? What do you think, how do you think I'm clever? So I, we went to have a look at it, and I said, well, like, can I, you know, be, I, I won't tell you what it's worth until I get the art experts to have a look at it. And he said, well, it's on the database, it's sold for 10. I said, well, let me just have a look. So we looked at it, put it under ultraviolet light, and my experts took me to one side, and he said, Philip, there's a problem. So I said, well, what's the problem? He said, it's been ripped all the way from the top left to the bottom right. He said, this has had a major accident. And, um, and we, we, we then did our homework, and we find out that the it had fallen off the wall, it had smashed, it had been ripped, it had been, the insurers had paid out 10 million to the owner, had re-offered it to a dealer for 2 million because it was completely damaged. The dealer had spent 100,000 having it repaired, and he sold it for six million. The picture is pretty well unsaleable unless more than a million or two. So that database would be absolutely useless. And that, that's one of a hundred lessons I could go through. In terms of why are we the only fund in the world that does this and the track record and so on, um, that's the critical thing. But the, the problem is that we, we have a team of a lot of people with a lot of experts, and to replicate what we do is extremely expensive. And so barriers to entry are huge. And the banks all want us to do it for them because they don't want to have a niche. They just can't see the value in doing a 500 million or billion dollar fund with 40, 50 people and all this. And art experts are incredibly difficult to manage. They're mavericks. They have their own way of thinking and it's not always the way the businessmen. So my skill is to try and take what the art guys say and turn it into uh, the business side. Any other questions? Yeah, you've got a question. Yeah. So yes, hello. So my question is more related to new technology, especially blockchain. So those past two years, we have seen a lot of talks about blockchain and art, how blockchain can make the art market more transparent yeah. and also help to track this fake yeah. example that you talked about. Do you think it's like more an utopic scenario like now or you think it's like worth it to invest in blockchain? Blockchain and the arts, how compatible the, is it? The, the for issue the is that blockchain requires art experts to convey their knowledge and put it on paper and then encode it into the... And um, you ask any of the top experts if they'll put their ideas and thoughts onto paper to go into blockchain that's going to be used for the future. They say, that's why you hire me for $200,000 a year because... If you want to give me one pound for my each bit of information I put in, I'm, I'm out of a job. So it's like turkeys voting for Christmas. So <laughs> if you want all the art world to vote for Christmas, they'll do blockchain. So my bet is that five of the world's top 1,000 will do it, and the other 995 won't. And until you can persuade them to do it, blockchain's useless. So it's a great idea. It could work in all the other industries, but the art world is against it because they don't, want to lose their, they don't want to lose their jobs. So I've asked them, I said, you know, if I paid you 10 million, would you do it? They said, yeah, for 10 million, I'll do it. But, but if, you're, you know, if you're gonna give me one pound per bit of information, no. So 
that's the practical. I always try and look at the practical. I try and say, Does it, is it going to work? Why, think of the human psychology and how do you break it? Any other quest, last question? Yeah. Um, if your business is fundamentally built around uh, rarity, perhaps significance and condition, isn't yeah. that something that could be just replicated into various other, particularly around the hunt for rarity, but also significance and condition in terms of other markets? Um, we could see a uh, fine art X or a fine art Y guitars, fine art, you know, yeah. just, just effectively like a virgin it, or like an easy... Yes, sorry, easy it is. Easy jazz is mean, probably not the best uh, No, we, 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 we look at rarity. That's where we're in. That's the game. We're in the top end of the game. That's where the money's made. Um, the best, the finest, the rarest. That's... It, but, but then you... And understanding. I mean, I'm looking at violins now. I sat, I sat down and had... Uh, uh, drinks the other night with a guy who has 100 million of, of, of uh, Stradivarius. And that's all he focuses in on. And I was talking about going into that market. I look at the watch. But, you know, you go at the very top, rarity, condition. You're absolutely right. In a sense, the answer to your question is, you know, is there a... The answer is rarity and condition. You, you picked it up. You're probably ahead of the MBA program or something. Yes. I think that's all I've got time for. Um, I'd like to be, say thank you very much. None of you fell asleep through my speech, and I'm very grateful for the invited. Thank you.